Hi, and welcome back to our AP Chemistry classroom. And today we are exploring gases. And so we are going to be talking about the ideal gas law, what an ideal gas is, and all of the other laws that helped us to relate the macroscopic behavior of a gas to its microscopic behavior. So um, as I said, we're gonna be able to explain the big scale, the macroscopic, using the relationships between pressure and volume, and temperature and moles and that gas constant R. And then also we're gonna be talking about how we explain the behavior of gases on a molecular level. So let's just jump right in. So we're gonna start with the gas laws. So we're gonna start with the macroscopic. So we're, we know that we can relate pressure, volume, temperature, number of moles and the gas constant. And those are related with what we call the ideal gas law, which is um, PV equals NRT. So this is the overarching law. All of the other gas laws are derived from this gas law, where P is pressure, V is volume, N is number of moles, R is the gas law constant, and T is the temperature in Kelvin. Now you'll notice on your equations and constants sheet that you have several different R values listed and they differ based on which units are being used for pressure. All of them are going to expect the volume is being measured in liters um, and that T is being measured in Kelvin. So they vary basically on just the units for pressure. Now one of these is in joules per mole Kelvin and that's the 8.314. So we'll use that one a lot more when we work with thermodynamics and we're working in units of energy, but it is here in our gas equations. So you might remember when we learned the gas laws in our previous chemistry courses that there were several other gas laws. So let's go back and take a look at those. So we learned Boyle's law that says that at constant temperature and pressure, pressure constant temperature and number of moles, pressure and volume are inversely proportional. So that means that um, as pressure goes up, volume is going to go down, or as volume goes up, pressure is going to go down. Then we have Charles' law that tells us that volume and temperature are directly proportional to one another if we keep pressure and number of moles constant. And then we have guy lussacs law that tells us that pressure and temperature are directly proportional if volume is constant. And the combined gas law keeps only the number of moles constant and relates pressure, volume, and temperature to one another. And then we have Avogadro's law that tells us that volume is proportional to the number of moles. But all of these laws are derived from the ideal gas law. So as long as you know this one, which is on your equations and constants sheet, you can get to any of the others. So we can use this to solve for molar mass or for the density of a gas. Again, this is a derivation of the PV equals NRT um, equation. Um, we can most often, I think it's easiest if you solve the PV equals NRT equation, the ideal gas law, and then um, do whatever stoichiometry or whatever other manipulations you might need. Then we have one more gas law, and this is Dalton's law of partial pressure. And that just tells us that the sum of the partial pressures in any mixture is equal to the total pressure of that mixture. So these are our mathematical relationships that express what's happening at a macroscopic level. So we can use these to um, express what's going on with any of our gases. So one of the most common applications of our Dalton's law of partial pressures is that we tend to collect gases over water. So when we're doing an experiment and we wanna know how much gas is being produced, then we might um, collect that gas in a device that looks like this one. So let's say that we have a little pile of calcium carbonate here and we are heating it and that's gonna cause the calcium carbonate to decompose and that's going to produce carbon dioxide. And the carbon dioxide would then be collected over here above water. So the water is getting displaced and only the gas is being trapped. Now, if we have a udiometer, and I'll show you one of those in class, um, then we are able to measure 
what volume of gas is being collected. We can figure out what pressure it's being collected at, and therefore we can learn um, the uh, number of moles that were produced using PV equals NRT and then a little bit of stoichiometry. But when we're collecting water gas like this, there's also going to be water vapor being collected in here. And so um, we need to subtract out the pressure that's coming from the water vapor in order to be able to use our ideal gas equation. So we can measure the um, temperature and that's gonna tell us what the vapor pressure of water is at that temperature because this is published, these are known values. So we can subtract out the pressure that's coming from water. We know the rest of the pressure is coming from the gas and we can then plug that into our um, ideal gas law equation. Another way that we use Dalton's law is that we talk about mole fractions. So a mole fraction is the number of moles of a particular um, component of a mixture of gases divided by the total number of moles in that mixture of gases. And so we can figure out the mole fraction. And then because we know that the partial pressure is the sums of the partial pressure are the total pressure, we can multiply the total pressure by the mole fraction in order to find the partial pressure of that gas. Okay, so here's our practice problems and we'll go over these in class, but let's go ahead and jump into what's happening on the molecular level. And so we explain this with something called the kinetic molecular theory. So we went through the gas laws to explain what's happening on a macroscopic level. Now we're looking at what's happening on a molecular level. So we've already talked about these. Okay, so what do we know about gases? Gases expand to fill their containers. They're fluid, that means that they flow. They have a very low density, one one thousandth the density of the equivalent liquid or solid. They're compressible, they effuse, they diffuse. So how do we explain all of that? What's happening on a molecular level? So we have this theory called the kinetic molecular theory. It's a model, it describes an ideal gas and it's based on five postulates. And so the first one is that all gases are made of tiny little particles and that their volume of the individual particles is tiny compared to the space in between those particles. And so we say that the volume of gas particles can be ignored because they're so small compared to the distances between the particles. The second tenet of the kinetic molecular theory is that gas particles are in constant random rapid motion. They move in straight lines until they either bump into each other or into the walls of the container. Third tenet is that the particles have no attractive forces or repulsive forces between them. So we assume that we can ignore the effect of intermolecular forces. Fourth tenet says that the average kinetic energy of a gas is proportional to its temperature in Kelvin. And we remember that kinetic energy is equal to one half the mass times the velocity squared. And then lastly, we assume that those collisions that we were talking about earlier are elastic. That means they lose no energy when they collide. And then we also know that the collisions with the walls of the container are what causes gas pressure. So what's the point of all of this? How does this explain the um, behaviors of gases? So we do have to remember when we talk about ideal gases, the assumption that we make in all of those gas laws, the um, ideal gas law, Boyle's law, Charles law, um, Gay-Lussac's law, even um, Dalton's law, we assume that the gases are ideal, that they obey all five of these tenets of the kinetic molecular theory. And we will be talking about deviations from ideal, but for right now, understand that ideal means that it obeys all five of these assumptions. So in terms of what the kinetic molecular theory really means, what it tells us, um, one of the things that is key about the kinetic molecular theory is that kinetic energy is directly proportional to the temperature of the gas. So what does that mean? That means that as the temperature of a gas increases, the 
movement of the molecules of the gas also increases. And so we'll often see these, what we call Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions. Um, and so this is just showing the distribution of the um, number of molecules with a particular speed. Okay, this one is not kinetic energy, this one is speed. Um, and so you'll notice that as the gas heats up, that the peak, which of course is the average, so our peak is moving to the right. So our speed is increasing as we go from a cold gas to a room temperature gas to a hot gas. But remember, this is an average speed, an average velocity. And so we're always going to have some particles that are moving more slowly and some particles that are moving more quickly. Now, when the average is high, that means that there's essentially more opportunity for the particles to be at either extreme. So you get this broad low curve when you, the temperature is high. And as the temperature gets colder and colder, there's a narrower distribution of those speeds. Um, so distribution changes as temperature changes as well. But remember that when we talk about kinetic energy being proportional to temperature, we're talking about the average kinetic energy. So that's this peak. So what does this mean? It means that if we look at um, just the movement of two gases that have the same mass, and we can see sort of from this image that this is showing that gas A is moving faster than gas B. So if gas A is moving faster than gas B, whoops, um, and they have the same mass, the only difference then is this V. And that means that gas A, which is moving faster, has a higher kinetic energy, which means it must be at a higher temperature. OK, if we look at two gases that have the same velocity but have different masses, so we have gas A that has a smaller mass and gas B that has a larger mass, at the same velocity, gas B is going to have a greater kinetic energy because that 1 half mv squared is going to have a larger m. So we need to be able to interpret this, whether we're given um, words, particle diagrams, or numeric values. So how does this kinetic molecular theory explain the nature of gases? Well, why do they expand? They expand because there's no intermolecular attractions holding them in place. So they can expand to fill whatever space they're in because there's nothing holding them together, unlike a liquid. Why do they flow? Again, that weak or non-existent intermolecular attractions means that they're going to just slide past one another and they're going to be fluid or they're going to flow. Why are they compressible? Because the volume of the particles themselves is so minuscule compared to the space between them that you can press them closer and closer and closer together. Why do they have low density? Again, those massive spaces in between them. They're made up of tiny little particles with huge spaces in between, and that's what gives them that low density. And then why do they effuse and diffuse? Because they are in constant random rapid motion. And so let's talk a little bit about effusing and diffusing. So our rate of effusion is going to be related to the mass of the particles. So this comes back to the idea that um, the kinetic energy is equal to 1 half the mass times the velocity squared. So if you have um, two things of different masses, they're going to be moving at, and they're at the same temperature, they're going to be moving at different rates. The lighter one is going to be moving faster. The heavier one is going to be moving more slowly. Even though they have the same temperature, the same kinetic energy, they have different velocities. And Graham's law expresses that relationship. You're not going to be asked to explain, to apply this quantitatively, but you may need to be able to explain this qualitatively. So if we look at diffusion, that's when um, movement of the gas molecules is unimpeded. Um, and an example of this might be if you, um, walk by a candle store in the mall and you can smell the scents from the candle store even in the hallway of the mall. Um, that's diffusion or you walk in the front door of the 
upper school building and you can smell the um, <laughs> the chloroform from the um, dissections in the bio lab. Okay. Effusion is when it's leaking through a small hole or moving through a small hole. It relies on the same mechanism that particles are in constant random rapid motion, um, but it's going to be going through a small opening. And so it's generally going to be a little bit slower, but again, the smaller the molecules are, the faster they're gonna effuse. All right, and that winds up our information and we'll start with practice problems in class tomorrow. As always, I look forward to seeing you and to answering your questions.